uh, you know, I actually debated this one for a while. See, the episode starts. Don't worry, I'm going to talk about this in a weird way compared to the way I usually do this. The episode starts. Riker's down there. He's badly written and b- kind of acting bad. But he's like, hey, I've been injured. And they check and they're going to beam him up. They're like, hmm, there's something in there that the biofilters isn't quite catching. And I kind of like that. I kind of like that the biofilters are being you know, used the way they should be and that there's something that they just can't deal with because it's directly tied into him. It can't se- separate the two. Okay, I, I'm kind of with that. Um, so then Jordy wanders over, and Riker, who has been sitting there waiting for Jordy, is like, hey. And Jordy is like, hey, we should be careful about this. Riker, this, no, it's just a scratch. Riker, if you don't think this is a big deal, why are you just sitting there waiting around for Jordy to come help you with this? <sighs> Honestly. Anyways. <clears throat> so then they beam him up, and they're like, oh my gosh, there's some... There's some weird thing in his system, and it's, it's causing his neurons to weird out. Oh my gosh, Riker's in serious trouble. And there's some legitimately tense music that's playing throughout the whole intro. So aside from some bad acting and bad writing when it comes to Riker, which is just weird, I'm kind of with it. You know, if up to that point, I'm like, all right. Then we get to the plot of the episode. Now, unlike most episodes, this episode has only one plot, and that is... Riker is having a medical emergency and needs to be saved. Now, even on the absolute basis of it, that's not a strong plot. Unless you are the kind of show where you are willing to kill off your main characters, all that means is, unless you're doing something with it, that they're in danger, they'll find the cure, and they do, which is exactly what happens in this episode. There's nothing to that, right? And... It's not like you can't do medical condition for good effect. In fact, there's an episode later on uh, with Worf, which I don't want to spoil right now, but, you know, the, the back one, which I actually like what they did with that episode because it wasn't about the medical issue. That wasn't really the dilemma of the episode. It was about how everyone around Worf and Worf himself dealt with the issue. There was some character stuff there. But there's no real character stuff here. It is telling that the Icarus Factor, an episode I didn't care for, had more character stuff for Riker than an episode in which he's literally dying. Let's rewind a minute. Let's talk about the the behind-the-scenes stuff. Every single... I, I actually spent more time on this episode than I do on most episodes, believe it or not. I really did. Because I wanted to look into a couple of things and give you some more concrete facts. And yet all of the behind the scenes stuff says the exact same thing. This is a crap episode and we're sorry. This is a crap episode and we're sorry. Multiple people all say the same damn thing. The only thing that made me go, hmm, at all about the behind the scenes stuff was a comment from Maurice Hurley. Now he wrote this episode and God does it show. And he was actually, he had already been given the pink slip. He already knew he was being fired and he was leaving the show. This was the last show he worked on. Now, I mention that because it is my opinion that Maurice Hurley in no way tried. And I I think that's important because the most common defense I hear of this episode is the studio issues. In fact, several, several of the creators gave that defense as well. The idea is the studio was... Well... Thanks in part to the budget issues er, I mentioned earlier, the budget budget issues which continued throughout season two because they went over budget several times, most notably on Q-Who, and then the the issues with the the writer's strike, which they were still reeling from, they, Paramount basically said, we need you to come massively under budget for this episode. We're giving you a three-day shoot. Now that's insane. Um, It's possible. Television has done that. Other Star Trek shows have done that. But a three-day shoot means you have three days of shooting. Now, I know that sounds like stupid, but let me explain what that means really from a functional perspective. It means a minimal amount of sets. It means a minimal size of the cast. And it means trying to do less than complex sequences in order to ensure that there's no need for you know, reshoots or you know, be, no room for people screwing up, basically. You have three days to film your entire episode. For reference, at this point in history, an average episode of TNG took closer to seven days to shoot. So you can kind of see the difference in the problem there. 
They were expecting to get shut down to maybe five days, which would still have been bad but workable, but three? Yikes. So that is the dilemma. Thing is, well, that dilemma is a very serious dilemma, and one which I'm going to posit a challenge to you guys. That does not excuse the script, which is just crap. It is boring. It is actively out of character for several people. Nothing of interest happens at any level, as far as I'm concerned, from any of the six points of story. There's no character development. There's no characterization. There's no setting development. There's the plot itself, as I mentioned earlier, is extremely weak. Um, what am I missing here? Character. Uh, I'm doing this wrong. There's no theme to the episode, and it's not fun. It's not enjoyable to to digest. So it fails on every single level of a story for me. I should say. I, sh I should clarify. Since obviously this is all my opinion. So I, can't, I, I cannot excuse Maurice Hurley for this god-awful script. I can understand the immense difficulty of pushing out a decent episode in a three-day time span. That's, that's crazy. What you need to do, if you're going to do that, I already mentioned this, really, really minimize your set and really focus on how you could do a very tight, quiet show. You're not going to have a lot of special effects, if any, really. And you're not going to be able to do much with regards to setting up like complex situations like you can't do some big fight scene, you can't do a massive choreography thing, you can't go, you can't do a lot of set design for certain characters. To explain what I mean a little bit, for example, it would be Worf shouldn't appear in this at all just because of the makeup time involved. Anybody with any significant makeup should not be involved in this episode at all. And if you're paying attention, nobody was, except for Data. Data was the exception. If I'm being honest, I probably would have written Data out too to help with that, but I digress. But that brings me to the other point. They only had three sets in this entire episode. The planet, the t transporter room, and the sick bay. So they obviously took the set thing. But I have to ask, and I know this sounds weird, why have the planet there? There's only uh, three, technically, scenes, but really just two scenes down on the planet. And both of them don't really add anything other than, okay, here's what we found. Let me, if you don't understand what I'm saying, let me pause it to you this way. Imagine that Geordi and Data are going down to the planet. So you hear um, Brent Spiner's voice on the comm. Picard's like, Picard's in sickbay. Data, I need you to get down to that planet along with Geordi. I need a sample of that right away. Okay, and you hear Data's voice. Understood, sir. I'll be on my way. Then when they come back, Geordi comes in. He's the one who physically enters the room and says, and, and hey, I've got the sample. And in the intervening time, you spend the time on Riker or on Troy or on Pulaski or Picard or, or some kind of do something with the characters involved, right? In this way, you cut the planet set out completely and the makeup necessity for Brent Spiner, thus removing some fat from the, from the budget in order to have more room in both time and money for other things to make your episode better. But that still leaves us with the really, really difficult problem of what do you do that is interesting with a three-day time budget and what is functionally one set? What do you do with that? And I, and I mention that because most bottle shows don't shrink down that much. That is really crazy. Even Duet, which was a bottle show, was not nearly as shrunk as this. Duet was on something like seven sets, I think. I'd, I'd have to actually go watch it. I meant to, but I, I forgot to. That's my fault. I apologize. But, um, and had, you know, and had a guest actor and had people in Cardassian makeup and Odo in makeup and Kira in makeup. So despite everything, that was not quite the same extent of a bottle show as this is being forced down to. This is a very serious challenge, which brings me to my main point. What would you do with this? You have three days of shoot time, okay? You can do whatever you want with those three days, but that's it. That's all you get. That's your budget. What do you do with that? Now, we know what they did, and what they did was a clip show. Now, let's make this clear. I've heard some people argue that, well, Star Trek's done clip shows before, to which I adamantly disagree. The Menagerie, Menagerie? Menagerie? Um, was not a clip show. It certainly used clips from the cage, but with a few exceptions, did so very smartly, and as part of that episode, that two-parter's plot. It was woven neatly and smoothly into it. It made sense for a lot of reasons, and I intend to praise the hell out of that episode, assuming I ever do get to do the TOS uh, ruminations. Um, there are some later episodes which have a couple of clips. Arguably, Trials and Tribulations has clips from The Trouble with Tribbles. 
but those aren't clip shows. A clip show is an episode where there's a very weak framework and then a bunch of clips. It's done when you either just don't have the time and money or you don't care. Clip shows are reviled for a reason, because they're extremely lazy and nothing really interesting tends to be done with them, with very, very few exceptions. In fact, to be blunt, I would say that by the definition of clip show, there has never been an exception. Anything that would be an exception is sufficiently different to not qualify as a clip show. The Farscape Scorpius example I know several of you are probably thinking of is a good example of what I'm talking about. So that brings us to this episode, the clip shows. I want to tell you a story. This is actually a story from a friend of mine, Pax, who I've referenced several times before, who is a Trek, you know, he's a Trek geek, just like, you know, probably everyone listening to this right now, including me. He used to love TNG as a kid, and he, like probably most of us back in the 80s and 90s, didn't exactly have access to cable or Netflix or the Blu-rays, right? No, we just had whatever they showed on the local station, right? So for several weeks in a row during the summer, one particular year, every Saturday when he had the time to just sit and watch his favorite show, which was Star Trek Next Generation, they showed Shades of Grey. Now, I don't know why, I can speculate, but the relevant part is, he grew to hate this episode. <laughs> and I don't blame him, because it's already kind of bland and boring just at the baseline, but it's just, it's just clips. I, I don't even feel like I need to explain why a clip shows a bad thing. Here's stuff you've already seen, okay. Um, you going anywhere with that? No, here's some more stuff you've already seen. Ugh. I also have to share another personal story with this. Whenever I think of this episode, there's a single line that just, for some reason, immediately clicks into my head. Dana, something's got me! I don't know why, it's just the first thing that comes to mind. Um... I know he repeats it more than once in the episode, but it's funny because I don't think of that when I think of Skin of Evil. Just this one. Dad, has something got me! <laughs> oh, I hate this episode. I really don't like this episode. I want to share one other small story, just really quick. So here's my notebook, right? Big, thick, tons and tons of notes here. So here's the note I've got for Shades of Grey. They only go down to here. I have, like, no notes. But what amused me is... It's the end of this particular sheaf. I'm going to be start starting a new section uh, when it comes to season three. Just idly amusing. That just I thought I'd share that. I have so little to talk about here. I have almost nothing to talk about. Um, so Jordy goes down with Data because he knows where Riker is, right? That just makes sense. It would be incredibly illogical for Jordy to say, okay, he's approximately this location, this many meters down this area. That would be insanity. No, we need to have Jordy be in danger of the same life-threatening thing that Data was because Jordy happened to see a spot. Then Data tells Picard about the symbiotic relationship between a predator and its prey because, because Maurice Hurley doesn't know what words mean. There's also some complaint about some of the medical community, medical truckers I know, who've looked at this and said, that's not really how endorphins should be working in this case, but let's just move on. And then there's the scenes with Riker and Picard, which are dry and boring and dull. Diana Moldauer, this is her, uh, Moldauer, sorry, this is her last episode. This is the last time we see Pulaski. What a hell of a way to go, right? <laughs> I mean, this is much better than Unnatural Selection, right? Jesus Christ. Especially since it, you really get the feeling from the actress that she's trying, but it really feels like she's trying too hard because her lines are bland, and so she kind of says them in a frenzied manner, which just it comes across as hammy or overacting, you know? Not a great way to go out on. And then Troy is just there to overact, and to tell, I'll be, t t to tell the doctor what he's feeling and thinking, including erotic thoughts. I know we, I've kind of already complained about the fact that there's just no privacy in TNG, apparently. No locks on the doors or on the holodecks, but is this really okay? Like, would you feel okay if someone's just like, wow, he's dreaming that one dream about the, oh my god, yeah, I, I can't come up with anything, but you know, it's something like that in front of everyone. It's just something kind of irritating about that that's always bothered me. And then she has, later on, 
<laughs> Pulaski has this line which just baffled me because it's at like the 30 minute mark of the episode. We're, almost, we're over halfway through the episode and she says, oh my god, if we don't recure this, he will die. Yeah, we know that. We've known that for like mm, about 17 minutes or so at this point. What's your point? Or wrong direction. 14 minutes, sorry. 14 minutes at this point. <laughs> that is one of the worst things a writer can do. Have someone just say repeatedly, if we don't do this, we'll die. And then later on, if we don't do this, we'll die. Is it's breaking two big problems. First of all, this, those statements are only said to try and create an artificial sense of tension. Because any actual tension will be generated from the knowledge of the situation or the way it's presented. You'll, you only have to give the kind of information once, and you don't have to do it vocally, which brings me to the second problem with that kind of statement. It is the, it is the definition of telling and not showing. And that's all I've got. I do have a quick factoid for you, and one other thing. And I swear I'm going to put more into this than just a few minutes, because I want to put some actual work into my work. I did the math. I had a timer stopwatch right here. This is a episode that is 45 minutes and 29 seconds long. Um, or, yeah. There are roughly, I didn't, whatever 16 minutes and 20 seconds plus 8 minutes and 46 seconds is of original footage in this episode. And I already did the math in terms of seconds, which means 55.2% of this episode is new and original footage. Which means 44.8% of it is clip shows. Not quite half, but... Anytime I've seen this or we watched this, and this, this I imagine you, some of you have the same reaction, all I can think of is the clip shows. That's all that comes to mind. Not only because the, the new stuff is boring and dull, but after the 16 minute and 20 second mark, the new stuff goes away. That 8 minutes and 46 seconds, that's it for the entire rest of the episode. Usually about 10 seconds at a time of new footage. Just a cut to Riker, and they're like, oh, we're stimulating him again, and then it fades into the new clip show. It's... It's like, to visually represent this, so there's chunk of new footage, and then there's like specks, little slivers of new footage, and then about two minutes right at the end, and that's it. <sighs> so let's get to the real point, because this is a crap episode. Everyone says it's a crap episode, right? I mean, the people who made this episode say it's a crap episode. In fact, one of my, uh, one of my favorite says, phrases when it comes to things like this is, no matter why it sucks, it still sucks. Because, yeah, I understand that Maurice Hurley was getting fired. I had already been fired, basically. And, yeah, I understand that they were massively under budget. And, yeah, I understand that they had the three-day timeline. But that, that's the why, not the what. This is still a crap episode, despite the reasons why it's a crap episode. But I want to challenge you, and I've been challenging myself to this for several days, and I've actually been thinking about this as I've been working on other episodes. What would you do to try and make this work? I kind of mentioned that earlier. But remember, three-day limitation... I would love to hear your guys' thoughts to see what you can come up with. I came up with three ideas that I decided to blend into one thing, okay? Let's keep the medical emergency, all right? Let's go, I don't want to, but whatever. So let's keep the medical emergency. Riker gets hit by this thing. It starts affecting his neurons. She says, it's spreading through his leg. I'm going to have to amputate because I can't stop the spread. Now, the dilemma doesn't become, will I cure him? Okay, I cured him. The dilemma is, do we, you know, is Riker going to be okay with this amputation? How are we going to recover him for it? How much is he going to be changed or altered? Is he going to want to go through with it at all? Would he rather go with the long odds and try to have this cured? Or would he play it safe? Given that this is Riker, that's an interesting question, I think. And I think he would debate it more than once. I would love to see a scene with him debating this with Jordy. Someone who already has to have something in order to be able to function in normal society. I would love to see him debate this with Data, who would have the purely pragmatic perspective. But given all that Data has gone through, I think Data would understand the desire to not change in that way. It would be, and, and I, I could just see Data making the analogy, it would be as if you took off one of my arms and replaced it with one of flesh. It may still be just as functional, but it's completely different. I will have no idea how to operate it. I will not know its efficiency. I will not know its precision. It will be an unknown, and the unknown is terrifying. The next thing I would do with that dilemma is I would go ahead and con uh, have the characters really examine the consequence of exploration, tie back into the Q-Who point. 
you know, it's going out into the wild and exploring the galaxy is a terrifying and dangerous place. It is, to quote Q, not for the timid. They very, very briefly touch on that. Picard and Riker spend like 40 seconds talking about that. But have that be an actual theme. Have that be kind of the point. The idea, you know, have, have some of the episode focus on Picard. Over on the side room there, keep it to the one set, after all. And he's just, you know, Patrick Stewart can act with his face. So, get it. so he's puts on a brave front for Riker and he goes over there and he just, mm, you know, get across the idea, probably not vocally, that Picard, for all his statements, no, I know what I would do. I know what I would do. I would have Picard stay, say out loud what he does not think. And I would have Patrick Stewart act it in a way so that it's clear that's what's happening. Have him say risks are part of the job. Have him say it's acceptable, you know, it's considered acceptable loss for the sake of humanity expanding and all this stuff. And have him say it in a way that it's clear that he's just, at heart, a human being who cares about another human being, who is hurt by the idea that despite all of the on-paper cold logic of the situation, he does not want to lose Will, his friend and his first officer. I also personally think that I would have, if this was my idea, I would have Riker take the cybernetic change and I would have that come up again in you know, the end of season three. But anyways. And then the final point. Troy. <laughs> I mean, Troy's there for a lot of this episode, but for God's sake, she doesn't seem to do anything other than announce to the world what Riker's thinking. You have a character who is a built-in connection to another character, and the two actors have decent chemistry with each other. Do something with that. Have Riker putting on a brave front for everyone. And then have a scene, maybe about midway through, about the beginning of the second act or third act, something like that, where Troy comes in and just sits down and just looks at him for a second, right? And Riker looks back, and they're just looking at each other, not too long, just a few seconds. And then Ry uh, Troy looks down... And you can see, I know, I know this woman can act, so don't tell me she can't do this. Have her look down and have her clearly struggling with this and have her reach out and put a hand on his and then have his facade crack at that physical contact with someone that he cares about so much and is so connected to. Just, mm. And have, it, no, not, no dialogue, just, mm. you could just see him physically react and show how afraid he is. How much he's not sure what he should do or how he should do it or if he's even going to be himself again, if it'll be difficult to move or walk. And like I said, I would have this have consequence. I would have him take the augment and I would have the, towards the end of the episode, have Riker. He would still look the same. You know, it's, I, I, there would be no changes because budget to Jonathan Frakes. But I would ask B Jonathan Frakes to do a little bit of an odd limp, like he just doesn't quite know how to use that leg, that left leg for a bit. And I would have him do that for several episodes in season three. Showcase that this is something that is still bothering him. Not just as a visual thing. Have it impact him every now and again. Like, I, I, could, I, I don't know of specifics right off the top of my head, but you know, have a moment where he's trying to get up to go do something quickly and he just stumbles for a sec. And there's this pause and you could see, just see him kind of okay, whatever, and let's just do this, right? Have Riker have to regain his balance more or less literally so that by the time Shelby comes along, he's a lot more sure of himself. That's all I got. <laughs> That's the best I could come up with in, in, in design for the makeup of this episode. I'm hopeful that some of you guys can come up with something else as well. I feel weird doing such a short episode because I spent, I've spent so much time working on this one. I hope you've enjoyed Season 2, in all its bipolar weirdness, has finally concluded. It is time at long last to start Season 3, where TNG gets really good. I'll see you next time, guys.